So what I'm going to be presenting today is work in another strand of research um, that's on social identity. So you've heard about a little uh, about my work on social networks. This is my work on social identity. Of course, it's all one big project to try and understand um, an economic actor as a human being in a social context. Okay, so this work that I'm going to discuss today um, is about bias. And so the title is Deconstructing Group Bias, trying to get a nice word in the title there. Um, because we have a lot of studies of group bias, but what is actually going on within that bias? That's what this, my agenda is about. Okay, so I don't think I have to tell you that group conflict, <coughs> excuse me, is a continual feature of human history, right? We know, and I'm sure there's many people in this room who studied how people define themselves and as vis-a-vis -vis others. So groups of people define themselves as vis-a-vis -vis others and, and different, and this different can be based on religion, race, ethnicity, nationality, and so on. And these divisions can be quite powerful. They excuse forcible extraction of labor and resources from others. So these are some very, I'm just referring to obviously some very um, stark historical examples where people divide themselves into groups. So you might think of yourself as not like the other person. The other person might not even be a human being. So you're able to enslave the other person or to kill the other person, use their labor and so on. Um, and we also know that these group conflicts have been rife for regional disputes, country boundaries, and so on. This is a, a picture of the, a painting of the US Civil War. We might forget that the United States experienced one of the most bloodiest conflicts in its history was its own civil war, so more people died in the US Civil War than died in any of the wars that America has fought in. So it was an extraordinarily bloody conflict, and people, historians, will talk about this war as, in, in fact, a battle over identity. What is America going to be? So these are all historical examples, of course, and maybe something that seems mild and somewhat amusing might be a sports rivalry. Well, but maybe it's not so mild and amusing after all, because we don't know what's going to happen with the boundaries of Spain and Catalonia and so on. So this is just to say, uh, you know, this is ranging from something as, as, as horrible as the Holocaust to perhaps something as innocuous as a sports rivalry, but yet it's all part of human history. And again, I'm sure many of you in this room have studied these phenomena. This is a big grandiose introduction um, to the topic. And this topic has been long studied in sociology and social psychology. And what, do we, what have people done with these conflicts in terms of the lab? There's this experimental tradition where participants have been brought into the lab, and all seems incredibly mild compared to the historical examples I've just you know, presented to you. But you bring participants into a laboratory, you divide them up into groups, and then you have, give them a task to perform, and then you see what happens. And not surprisingly, given this feature, I'd like to move around, so I'm gonna go here. Uh, given this feature of human history, that in-group bias, at least on average, is a very robust finding of these experiments. What I'd like to do today is talk about some economic experiments, particularly one that I've done, um, on group bias. And this work is inspired by uh, this research I've done on I what we're called identity economics. This is a joint research with George Akerlof. And what did we do in this work? In this work, we took the models, the very stark models of human beings uh, that are in typical economic models where this human being is, doesn't have a social uh, notion of her, him or herself. And we've talked about people, we've modeled people as having a social identity. And once you have the social identity, there's norms which affect how people behave and how they interact with others. And not surprisingly, again, given the history that I just described, once we introduce this notion of identity, we can think about how identity affects income allocation and redistribution. So if you stop thinking, if you think of yourself as different from someone else, you may not be interested in allocating income to that person. Okay, something very, very simple. And the idea of this experiment, the set of the set of experiments I'm going to describe, is to test the strength of identity um, and how it affects income allocation. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, so what do we find? Is there a bias in income allocation that depends on identity? Right? 
And the answer is yes. On average, we do see that there is, just like in all of those social psychology experiments and some economic experiments that I will describe to you, we do see that if you look across individuals when they're placed into these groups, there is this bias on average for not giving somebody outside of their group as much money as somebody inside of their group. Okay, so there is an in-group bias on average. However, and here's the deconstruction part. So we've got an average, and I want to deconstruct that average, okay? There is a large amount of heterogeneity, individual heterogeneity. Some people in this experiment, some of our subjects, are biased. And they are biased actually regardless of the identity. Whatever group they're put in, so we have two different group settings, they exhibit a group bias. Okay, you with me? So it's the identity per se isn't important, it's just the fact that they're divided into groups. On the other hand, there are some people who are never biased. It doesn't matter if you put them even into a salient group, they're not going to adopt a bias. So when we look at this average, this average is actually extraordinarily misleading because in fact nobody pretty much behaves like the average. Okay? Some people are biased no matter what kind of group you put them in, and other people are not biased at all. So these results are giving us an idea to talk about people as either being groupy or not groupy. And the tendency to have an in-group bias could be an individual trait. So some people, you put them into a group, any group, they're going to start to have this bias. Other people are the kind of, what's this group I'm in? They're not going to react in that same way to being in a group. So we're developing through this experiment, and a set, a set of experiments, in fact, the notion of groupiness, right? Some people may be groupier than other people. And then we put on the context on top of that, and that, in some sense, mobilizes this tendency. Okay? So a, an identity entrepreneur, say, is going to want to try and find exactly those people who are groupy and get them to join them. And so we may have self-selection into these kinds of social movements that divide people. Okay, so that's this overall picture. This last bullet point, of course, I don't have evidence of that. I'm just saying that when we, once we deconstruct this bias and we see that it could be coming from particular individuals, then we have to think about how those individuals become mobilized into groups. Okay? All right. So what I'd like to do now, here I am, uh, what I'd like to do now is give you a sense of the um, experimental tradition in social psychology and see where we, and in economics, and see where we fit, and then present the results. Okay, so first the social psychology tradition. So a lot of this research is, again, I'm sure many of you in the room know, but others may not know, developed after World War II, when, in, of course, there was this horrific um, events um, of group uh, denigration. So the, the starting this tradition was this experiment um, by a team of researchers in the United States. And it was, it's called now the Robbers Cave Experiment. And what happened during this, this is a photo from this experiment. Okay. So this is in Oklahoma. And a group of 12-year-old boys are sent off to a summer camp in a Robbers Cave State Park uh, in Oklahoma. And they're divided into two groups. So it's a summer camp, right? There's, there, there's one's in one set, one part of the camp, and the other's in the other part of the camp. And one were called the eagle, eagle, Eagles, and one were called the Rattlers. And they set up, the experimenters set up um, games, contests between the two. And what they observed is this, uh, the, the, the kids became very, uh, 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 I would say, very antagonistic towards each other. So they were set, kept apart, and they were brought together for these games. What we see in this picture, of course, is some like flags that they're, that they're going to be waving at these contexts. You know, beat the rattlers, beat the eagles, right? So this is to show that, you, that, you, how, that you, you put people in a sense where you divide people into groups, you put them in a competitive environment, and it's very easy to get this, this very strong animosity. So the um, sociological tradition is sort of interpreting this set of experiments as showing that competition creates this animosity. Okay. Moving on in intellectual tradition, the next set of experiments um, is the minimal group experiments, and they were around 1979, where it goes completely on the opposite side. It says, you know what, let's see if we can get bias or animosity without competition. In fact, we're going to do it as minimally as possible, hence the word minimal groups. Okay. 
So in this set of experiments, um, boys, again, young boys were, um, were, were the participants, and they were asked to express, express preferences for either paintings by Clay or paintings by Kandinsky. Okay, so the subject participants come into the lab, they express preferences for Clay or Kandinsky, they're divided into two groups, then they're presented with matrices, so it's hard to see these, but these are the matrices, where they're asked to allocate points between somebody in their group and somebody out of their group. And again, the finding here is, oh, so that's what they're asked to do. They allocate um, points or money, well, actually points, to others in their own group and the other group. And then again, these experiments largely generated in-group bias. So they, the, these kids are allocating more points to kids who are in their group and less to people who are out of the group. Okay, that's a basic finding. And that's minimal group paradigm. Minimal group paradigm has been used over and over and over again in social psychology. Okay, so that's the history. Now let's go to economics. So we'll go to Chen and Lee's uh, paper, which is now 2009, and they're going to use this minimal group paradigm and study something economists call social preferences. So here we're specifically getting to income allocation. So at bread and butter economics, how much money am I going to keep for me and how much am I going to give to you? Okay, so the method of dividing subjects into groups is the same as the, uh, the, the Tadgeville and Turner. So participants express preferences for Klee or preferences for Kandinsky. Then they're divided into two groups according to these preferences. Uh, these are some of the decisions that they're asked to um, make. So uh, again, these are from the paper. What you should notice is you can't really tell from this, but what's different between this is we're moving from the social psychology world to the economics world. What's different is that this experiment, an economics experiment, the individual's own money is at stake. Okay? So the individual is allocating money to herself and allocating money to somebody else, and that person's either in her group or out of her group. And the question is, is she willing to give up some of her money for somebody in her group, but maybe less so for somebody out of her group? Okay? So that's the, that's the distinction. Um, so again, the own money is at stake. Uh, these are, uh, she, what the, that team is testing is the difference in social preferences, and social preferences is a precise word in economics that refers back to a utility function. And this is, might be a little bit hard to see. I'll just point them first. I don't know if you want to too far from my microphone, but there they are. Uh, here and here. So these are the differences in the weights that somebody places on their own money versus somebody else's money. So the social preferences is how much I care about how much money somebody else earns. Okay, that's what social preferences are. It's a very precise term. And again, what we found, what they find in this experiment is that individuals have different social preferences for people who are in their group versus out of their group. Okay? And what they specifically find is that individuals are inequity averse, so they don't like inequity. They, they like equality. They just like equality a little bit less for somebody who's out of their group, but they still like equality, okay? With me? But just less so for somebody who's out of their group, because that's that finding. Okay, so now, what did we do? Okay, so this is a set of, these are my co-authors, um, it's basically a Duke team. We have uh, now have a set of experiments. The 2017 date is a little misleading. We did the experiment a long time ago, but we've been now analyzing the data, so that's why it is a 2017 date because it was a different iteration of the analysis of the data. But what did we do? And again, we're inspired by the work that George and I did <laughs> on identity. So we want to understand if strength of identity matters. This minimal group setting is very pallid, right? And in fact, it's constructed to be pallid. But what if we ramp it up a little bit? What if we think of things that are more salient? And other people have done that too. So people have done that too. They've looked at salient groups or real world groups, but we wanted to put them together to have minimal groups and salient groups together in the same experiment to see if the salience matters, okay, relative to just a group division. Okay, so we have two settings. We have the Clay and Kandinsky setting. We have the minimal group setting, but we also have a political group setting, okay? So these are the Democrats and Republicans, and of course this is in the United States, the United States context. So we're gonna look at the same person, the same people, when they're in this very mild group setting where ah, you know, it doesn't matter whether they like Clay or Kandinsky, and then we're gonna look at them in a setting where presumably these differences matter to them. 
okay? And they may feel like themselves as Democrats or Republicans. And again, the other distinction is that we are going to be looking at individuals because once we talk about an individual being more or less attached to a group, I have to look at the individual, right? So I'm, I'm gonna be looking at the individual rather than the average. So again, that's the deconstruction part. So we can see what's happening on average. I wanna get down at the individual level, see what matters to individuals, and see if I can see where this bias is coming from. Okay, that's the goal of this experiment. And like I've told you, I've sort of given you the punchline away, we do see this in-group bias on average, but there is this large heterogeneity. And I'm going to, as we go through the talk, show you how we identify these groupy individuals versus these not groupy individuals once I get into the guts of the experimental design and the results. Okay. Um, I should give you a sense of the literature. And so this slide is for mostly the economists in the room to give you a sense of what is, has been done in the economics literature with just hints of what's outside. So, I don't mean to at all to present that this paper is the only one that has looked at identity and experiments in economics. There are a growing number of studies that have looked at various differences um, between people and the task. So there's experiments where um, people are from different ethnic groups in the United States and they're asked to play dictator games against each other. Okay, so there's. People have under looked at identity before. Um, and again, they're either doing, actually Chen and Lee were really the first ones to do minimal group experiments, but there's other people who have done real world experiments with real world categories. And again, what's different about our setting is we're putting them together. We've got minimal group and this real world group setting, and it's within subject. So we're looking at the same person all the way through. So again, the deconstruct the bias. Where is it coming from for particular people? Um, I should mention there's a very large experimental literature in economics and social preferences. As you might imagine, given that social preferences is supposed to represent something about how you care about another person and therefore has implications for things like income allocation and redistribution. So very long literature there on which, of course, we borrow a lot of techniques. A third literature to which we contribute is how we go about looking at the individual level. For any of you who've worked with economic experiments or experiments in general, you know it's very hard to get a lot of data on a person in an experiment. You've got to get them to do a lot of things. So we do that, but then we also have an experiment, an empirical technique to get at the individual level by using something called a finite mixture model. Okay, and I'm happy to discuss later, I'm not gonna get into the details of it in my talk, but I think what you want to take away from this bullet point is that it is hard to get at the individual level in experiments because you only have a subject in a lab or a participant in a lab for an hour. It's very hard to get them to do enough decisions to look at them at the individual level, but we're not lost, okay, if we are willing to impose some structure on our estimations. Okay, all right. So let me give you an overview of the experiment. First, it is important to know that this did take place at Duke University. So, you know, one has to understand our participant pool. Um, it is in conjunction, I should have mentioned, one of my co-authors is a um, neuro, uh, what, do you, what do we call himself? A neuropsychologist might be the way to talk about it. So um, he's my uh, collaborator on this research, and so this was conducted at the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences labs, which I should reassure you do not allow deception. Okay, so we're in a no deception lab. The specific task, again, borrows from the social preferences literature within economics, um, and Subjects are presented, participants are such presented with matrices where they're choosing income to self versus income to the other participant. So little i here is the participant, j is the other participant. They can either choose this allocation or that allocation. And I'm gonna show you examples. So this method again is not ours, it's from the social preference literature. What we did change in terms of the method though is we adopted neuroscience techniques for presenting it to subjects. Okay, so that allows us to get more data per subject. Okay, so this is the task. Let me show you what actually happened. Okay. Uh, 
subjects come into the lab, they're given instructions, then the first thing we do is have them face these matrices, these allocation matrices, with somebody who's just a random other participant in the experiment. The next thing we do is have, for, the, again, for each person, is we either have the minimal group treatment or the political group treatment. The order of the two treatments is randomized. In the minimal group treatment, we have them express preferences over paintings. So we did have Clay and Kandinsky, just like everybody else does, or did, and we also have other images. So we had maybe 20 images altogether. Then we divide the participants into the groups, and then we have them do these allocation tasks in group, out group. And I'll show you some screenshots of that later. The political group treatment, we ask the, the participants a series of questions about their political attitudes. We also, there were seven, uh, seven issues that were dividing the political spectrum and in the United States at that time. We also asked them their political party. And we asked them, uh, it, and we asked them their political party and their media outlets that they watch. And then we divided the groups into two groups according to the answers to those treatments. Again, they were presented with series of matrices, money for me, money for somebody else, whether that person's in my group or out of their group. And then the last thing is we have a post-experiment survey where we ask the standard, um, standard demographics. Okay, so that's how it went. One person went through the entire thing. It took about 45 minutes or so. You'll see it went actually very fast. Uh, it's missing. It should flash up here where they were paid. They were paid from each section of the experiment, and they were told they were going to be paid from each part of the experiment. Um, it is important to describe to you how the political, how we formed the political groups, because that's part of the whole story. Okay, let me just flash this back again. So remember, the minimal group, that's just Clay and Kandinsky, right? So people express preferences over paintings and over images, and we say, based on your answers to our survey, we've divided you into two groups. And we also gave them a little information that said, somebody in your group answered the painting questions, you know, five out of six of the painting questions, just like you did. Okay? When it comes to the political group, Again, we're giving them a survey about political opinions, and then we're dividing them into groups. But how do you know, we tell you exactly how we divided them into groups? Because this is part of, again, how we're going to analyze the data. The participants along this survey were asked the following question. Do you call yourself, I think, or do you, I forget exactly the words, do you identify as, and you were given a choice, Democrat, Republic, Independent, or none of the above? So that was the choices that a person was given, a subject was given. They could say they're Democrat, Republican, Independent, or none of the above. If they said Independent or none of the above, then we get, they got a further question that said, are you closer to the Democrats or are you closer to the Republicans? OK, you with me? All right. So then how do we divide the subjects into groups? We then have two groups. In the blue group, we put, well, they weren't blue, just blue for the the slide, we didn't say they were blue. Um, in the Democrat group, we put the Democrats, of course. We also put the folks who said they were independent or none of the above, but closer to the Democrats. So we put we, well, who we're calling Democrat leaning independents, okay? And in the Republican group, we put, we put the people who said they're Republicans, and we also put those who are independents, but lean Republican. With me? So in the construction of these two groups, we have people who identify more strongly, arguably, with the group in which they've been placed. So a Democrat in the Democrat group is going to feel like they've been put in the right place. A person who's already told me, the experimenter, that they're not a Democrat, but then they're put in the Democrat group, is arguably less identifies with the group in which he's been placed. Okay, so that's the design. So I want to understand, again, my objective was originally to see whether the people that are very attached to their group behave differently than the people who are not attached to the group and how that is all different than how they behave in a group that perhaps has no meaning, like those, the minimal groups. You with me on the design? Yeah? Okay, great. We end up analyzing only in terms of this difference of attachment to group or identification with group, we only end up um, analyzing the Democrats and the difference between the Democrats and the Democratic-leaning independents for a simple reason is that we don't have enough in the Republican group. 
So Duke is a, um, a typical American campus of its cohort, which, so it's dominated by Democrats, and remarkably so. And uh, this isn't an American audience, but when I tell that to American audiences, they don't believe it because Duke is in the South. But, uh, and I'll have something to say about the South a little bit later on in the talk. But Duke is very representative of its cohort of institutions. We checked. Okay, so that said, what do we do? Oh, actually, before what to do, I should show you. I've got my screenshots for you. I promised them. Okay. This is what the subjects are actually seeing when they make their decisions. So uh, they, they first, this is the neuroscience technique that I described because we essentially want to do this also with brain imaging. So we wanted to make sure that our, whatever we do behaviorally, we can also do with MRI um, studies. And it also allows us to get more data than typically on individual subjects. So first you see a slide that's kind of this neutral slide. Then you're presented with your decision that you're going to be making. This is money for you. This is money for somebody in the other group. You choose, you're going to choose between the top row or the bottom row. How you choose is by a blue, choosing the blue or the green uh, row. So you can only, only have to use two fingers and all of this. Imagine yourself a machine. All you have to do is two fingers, right? And that's how the decision is made. There's 26 total matrices, 208 decisions uh, per subject in the end. Everything is randomized, the top, the bottom, green, blue, left, right, et cetera. So we don't have a green effect, a blue effect, a top effect, a left effect, or right effect. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, to give you a sense of the trade-offs, uh, so, so this is the screen when it's somebody in the other group. This is the screen when it's somebody in your own group. And again, these, gets, these just flip back and forth randomly. So take a look at what a person's decision would be if they were um, choosing not 140, 40, but choosing 120, 120 instead. So this person, if they were to make this choice, would be going for a fair allocation where there is no inequality, but they're giving up 20 for themselves. So this is what economists call inequity aversion. You're willing to give up 20 for yourself in order to achieve equality. Okay? So that's a, a choice that somebody would be expressing aversion to inequity. Here's another slide, um, and again, uh, if they were to make this choice, if the, the subject were to make the choice of the green rather than the blue, this subject would be going for more money for everybody. Yeah, are we allowed to, okay. I'm happy to take questions. I didn't know what this ground rules are. No, go ahead. Why do we change the sum? Right. Right, well, because we wanted to see the sum between the two, because we wanted to see that people are actually willing to destroy resources. So it's different than a dictator game. Actually, a lot of people use dictator games where this, it's just splitting a pie. We're going to see, I guess it's coming up in two slides, that people make choices that actually reduce overall income. Okay, so a person that's choosing the top row uh, is, is going for uh, overall income that's higher. Um, okay, so this is the slide, it's coming right now. So imagine this person here, the, our person choosing 120, the blue row. Um, what this person is doing is giving up 20 for herself in order to make the other one go down by 80. Okay, so this is a, what we're calling a destructive person or an inequality, inequity loving person. We wanted to have this in our possibilities because of that those horrific histories which I showed you early on, right? People here might be willing to give up something of their own in really order to slam the other person. And perhaps what they're going for is to maximize the difference between themselves. Okay, so we wanted to have that as a possibility. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to report to you on those results, I don't have the time here, but I'm happy to um, answer questions about that. Okay, so these matrices and the interpretations, these words I'm giving you at the bottom are just in the social preferences language that economists have developed. Inequity averse, total social welfare or total income maximizing, dominance seeking, it doesn't quite have a word yet, but we've, we've coined that word. It has some, a few other people have looked at that too. All right, so now I want to analyze the data. So where was I? Okay, I was here and I was telling you I'm going to take a look at the difference between Democrats and Democratic leaning independents. That's kind of going to be where I'm going to start. Um, and I told you 
uh, why I'm only looking at them. So just here's the distribution of political affiliations and leadings within our subject pool. So you basically, are, we're just not seeing uh, Republicans. That's what we want. I wanted to show you here. Now there might be a problem in looking at Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents and comparing them. Right? It might be that they're actually very different. Okay? So I'm, I'm comparing uh, people that I put into the group. I say the only difference between them is that one set of people, one set of them, is more attached to the group in which they've been placed, and that's the only difference. Of course, we have to test for that. And indeed, everything we can test about them shows that they're the same. So they, they are the largest subsets in our subject pool, but they have identical demographics and they have identical political opinions. So we went and we looked at their answers to the surveys. They have identical political opinions. The only observable difference, again, from what we can see from the data we collected on them is that they are affiliated with the party, that they call themselves a Democrat. Okay? So that allows us this, val this comparison to be valid. All right. Let's get into some guts. Um, all right, some numbers. I want to analyze what these people's decisions have been. Again, I'm looking at in-group versus out-group. So we construct a measure which we're calling individual favoritism in allocating income. So let me run through what that is. You take an individual I, so one person, and we look at that person in a condition G for a given matrix M. Okay, so that means we take a look at, for example, this matrix. Remember, there's 26 matrices. Okay, so we do this matrix by matrix. So this person is making a, a, an allocation for this matrix once when they're doing it for somebody in their own group and once when they're doing it for somebody in the other group. Right, so they're seeing the same matrix twice. Everybody okay? They're seeing the same matrix twice. And so what I'm going to do is compare what choice they made for the other person so this is the other person, or you know, the, the person to whom they're allocating money, when it was somebody in their own group versus somebody in their other group, okay? So we subtract income given to the person when they're in the other group from the income given to the person when they're in their own group. For example, uh, this person could have chosen 100 when, for their own group, but 20 for the other group. Same matrix. Everybody okay? So 100 minus 20 is 80. Okay. So then we have 26 matrices. So then we average these differences over the 26 matrices, and that gives us an in-group favoritism. Okay, so it's a positive number if you're favoring people systematically who are in your group. Okay. So again, like I said, we average across the matrices to get favoritism for an individual I in a particular group condition, G. So we can get a favoritism measure for an individual in the minimal group and a favoritism measure for the individual in the political group. And our idea is to compare them, right? Depending on your, how attached you are to your group. So again, just repeat, we have now a measure for an individual, their favoritism, how much, they give, how much more money they give on average to somebody in their group when it's the minimal group condition and how much more money do they give on average to somebody in their group when it's the political group condition. Got it? Okay, just looking at allocations, nothing fancy. Okay, so here's the first data that I'd like to present to you. So on the, uh, all the way over here, it's just all of the subjects. This is just a simple box and whisker plot. Okay, I'm just taking the, um, this is the minimal group. It's the favoritism in the middle group. Each of these dots here is a subject. So I've got 141 subjects. I think I, that was, might not have been on a slide, but there's 141 people. So I've got 141 data points. What I've got here is I'm just putting down, putting the, in, the favoritism on, um, on a scale here, right? Uh, and this is just a box and whisker plot. So I've got the, the interquartile range and I've got the outliers, right? So what you should be noticing from this is that there are quite a lot of outliers so there's quite a lot of people who are showing a lot of in-group favoritism in the minimal group condition, but there's quite a range, again. And here's the, um, that's the mean, and that's the um, error around the mean. So the mean for everybody is positive. So here, this is just the deconstruction part, we're starting it. We've got the mean, but we see this big range, right? We've got lots of people who are far away from the mean. 
Okay. Now what I'm going to do is just look at the Democrats and look at the Democratic-leaning independents. So here's the Democrats. They look a lot like everybody. Well, that should, make, should be surprised that they're actually the biggest part of the subject pool. The most interesting finding, though, comes from looking at the Democratic-leaning independents. Now remember, this is in the minimal group condition. Okay, this is when people just expressed preferences over paintings. So take a look at these folks. What are they doing in that condition? They're basically showing no favoritism. Okay? So again, stare at that. The mean is zero. The median is zero. And there's not a lot of range either. Right? So again, to emphasize, this is the minimal group condition. Okay? And we've got a well-identified set of people who are showing no bias in that condition. So again, going back to the history of the experiments, the minimal group ex paradigm has been used over and over and over again. There's this consistent finding of bias, of in-group bias. And I've now found a well-identified set of subjects who don't show bias in a minimal group condition. Okay? So these are the people that we're gonna start to call not groupy. You put them in groups, and again, this is a mild group, right? You put them in groups, they don't care. But remember, this is the same mild division of people in groups that shows overall an in-group bias, because we do see it on average. Here it is. Okay. All right, so we can start to split our subjects into people who react to being in a group with people who don't react to being in a group. And we found them by looking at people who don't identify with the political party. And now, sort of going back, we didn't, this was not expected. Okay, this was the surprise. All right, now we've got in-group favoritism in the political group, and we see that there is more indeed in-group favoritism, and so we, we have, we've, we've tested all of these means, this mean versus that mean, this mean versus that mean. We, they're all significantly different from one another, but we can see there is more favoritism, in-group favoritism in the political condition, which we might expect because it's more salient. But again, now that we have everybody in the same experiment, I can compare minimal group to political group. The real world versus this relatively mild uh, minimal group setting. Okay, so again, I want to emphasize that this is the kind of finding that I'm going to emphasize and build on. So what this finding tells us is, look, there's some people who don't react to being in groups and my question then is, are these people here who are not reacting in this group, uh, in, the, in the minimal group, are they the same people who aren't reacting in the minimal group, sorry, the political group too? Is this guy, that weird outlier person here, is that the same as this outlier? I don't know, I can't do that with just my boxes and whiskers, right? So what I want to now look is at the correlation between favoritism in the minimal group and favoritism in the political group. And that's going to start to give me a better sense. Are there some people who show favoritism in both conditions, none of the conditions, only one of the conditions, and so on? Okay, so now I'm just going to plot in-group favoritism, minimal group, and in-group favoritism, political group, on one picture. See what it looks like. Okay, here's the next picture. I've got 141 dots. Again, what is this plotting? It's plotting it, on the x-axis, the in-group favoritism in the minimal group, on the y-axis, the in-group favoritism on the political group, and I've plotted the 45-degree line for you. And what you should be seeing is that most of the subjects are along the 45-degree line. And if you look at the correlation, it's 0.63. It's a very high correlation. And, the, and I also have the regression lines, but um, we're not reporting them. So, what you should be taking away, this, again, there's probably two pictures that you should take away from the whole talk. This one here, where you've got these folks who are not reacting in the minimal group condition, and this picture, which is where you're seeing that what somebody does in the minimal group condition is a fantastic predictor of what they will do in the political group condition. Are you with me? So if somebody's groupy, and they are reacting to being in a, in a very arbitrary setting, that's also the person who's likely to react in the more real world salient setting. On the other hand, if you're not likely to react in this minimal group setting, you're also not likely to react in this more salient setting. Okay. 
So these people we can start to call not groupy. Okay, these people are not reacting, they don't have an in-group bias in either setting. Now, okay, you with me? These people, they're showing no in, virtually no in-group bias in either setting. Now, I should say that within here, I could deconstruct this further. And in, you know, just to give you a sense of the layers that we can go to, these people are not treating somebody in their group um, differently than somebody than out of their group in either setting. That does not mean they're being nice to them. Okay, it could mean they're just taking money for themselves. No matter who they're facing, they're taking money for themselves. Somebody in my group, I take all the money for myself. Somebody out of their group, I take all the money for myself, whether it's political or minimal. Okay, so that, they're in here. Also in here are people who are into fairness. I'm gonna be fair to somebody in my group. I'm gonna be fair to somebody out of my group, whether it's minimal or political. I'm just always fair. Okay, they're, I can't distinguish them from this data. That's what the, the rest of the analysis is gonna try and do, or part of the rest of the analysis is gonna try and do. What I'm just showing you here is that there's some people who whatever group you put them in, they don't change their behavior and they don't act differently to somebody in versus out. Okay, so they're not groupy. These folks, on the other hand, are groupy. They're treating somebody out of their group differently than they're treating somebody in their group, and they're doing that consistently, okay? All right, so this is from the raw data, as in just taking a look at the allocations and how much money is given to somebody in their group versus out of their group. So the next thing we do is we do a structural estimation of social preferences. So we're in this world of the social preference literature within economics, we're going to have a utility function, we're going to estimate parameters of this utility function. Again, social preferences are very precisely uh, it's, a, it's a word that means something in economics. It's how much people care about their own money and how much people care about somebody else's money. That's called the social preference. So we do a structural estimation of utility function. We posit a utility function on own income and other person's income. We estimate the social preferences on average, and we should be happy to know that we actually represent, replicate pretty much exactly Chen and Lee's findings. Okay, different subject pool, we use the same methodology, get the same results, and that's about the average. But we're looking at the individual, so we're estimating individual social preferences, and using this latent class model, which I don't have time to talk about, we categorize individuals as groupy versus not groupy. And what does that mean? It means that the social preferences that we estimate are different towards the in-group than towards the out-group. Okay, so it's not just money that's different, we actually look, we estimate a preference of money for this other person, whether that other person is in their group versus out of their group. And if those preferences are different, and they're significantly different in a way that we can talk about, then we're gonna call that person groupy. If not, we're gonna call that person not groupy. I'm gonna skip that slide. So here's what we, um, what we do is we say, okay, take, this is just an example. We take um, people, how they acted in the minimal group towards somebody who was in their group. This is the minimal group, and this is somebody outside of the group. And then we've, we've categorized people according to their social preference. So some people are selfish. Remember those words I was using? Some people are inequity averse. Some people are total welfare maximizing, and so on. And we want to see, are you selfish towards somebody in your group, and you're selfish towards somebody you're out of your group? or you're selfish towards somebody in your group and you're really destructive towards somebody out of your group, right? So we have a cross-tabulation. Um, the diagonal are people who are acting, have the same social preferences in group versus gal group. Like I said, it's not that they're all being nice. Some people are being selfish all the time. Some people are being inequity averse all the time. Some people are slamming the other person all the time. But the point is that they're not changing in group versus out group, so they're on the diagonal. Those are the people we're calling not groupy. And off the um, diagonal are the people who are groupy. Okay, so they're, they're perhaps being, so that person, for example, is inequity averse towards somebody in their group, but for somebody out of their group, they're gonna slam them. That's what that, those 10 people are doing. Okay, so now we have a way of dividing the people up into groupy versus not groupy using statistical tests on social preferences. 
And then if we just go back to take a test and look at our box and whisker plots, we just see an exaggerated picture of what we had before because we're able now to not just to do Democrats and, non, and Democratic leaning independents, I have this other criteria. So I'm looking at the entire subject pool and dividing them into groupie and not groupie, not just relying on that, that political affiliation. Okay, is everybody with me? So now I've looked at the entire subject pool and I've categorized people as groupie versus not groupie in the way that I've described according to their social preferences. All right, so next question, who are these people? Let me skip that one. We've got demographics. Again, we're looking at the individual level, so I can look at each person and look at their demographics and say, who is the, or do not groupie people look different than groupie people? And the answer is, Pretty much they look the same. For the, again, we didn't, these, are, these are the demographics which we looked at. We didn't look at all of our demographics. We looked at the standard ones, which is gender, race. We looked at born in the United States. We looked at distressed changers, strangers, no religious attendance, and political party, which we thought might be correlated with groupiness. And then we have the other demographics um, that represent family income or education levels. So nothing comes up except two very interesting features. One is that the people who are not groupy are more likely to be politically independent. So that how I found this to begin with, which was by accident, is actually coming up in the entire subject pool. So this also has the Republicans in them now too, right? Everybody's here. So this is, in some sense, giving a bit of external validity to the finding that some people are not groupy. So they're not groupy in my lab, they're also not joining a political party outside the lab. Yet they have the same political preferences, right? Same political positions, but they've decided not to be in a party. The other thing that comes up is a uh, father has a, an advanced degree, and these are very special people. The, first of all, the whole subject pool is very special people. These are Duke students. Um, advanced degree here means that um, their father has a master's degree or above. And like 30% of our subject pool uh, has, has fathers with those kinds of degrees. So it's a very special subject pool. But we are finding though that, that, that participants whose father have these very advanced de degrees are less likely to be groupy. Okay, so they're not groupy. What could be going on? Maybe it's an income effect. These pa parents, this is a very wealthy family. It could also be that the parents have and, you know, have transmitted some sort of value, I don't know, right? But I do know that father's education seems to matter. Why it might be an income effect is mother's education doesn't, but father's education does, okay? So father's education uh, matters. Okay, so when I'm, at this point, I hope I've convinced you that there, our experiment shows there's groupy people and not groupy people, and we have some indication of the correlates. Of course, we're missing, you know, it's a very special place in the world, our little campus. So our next step is to take this outside our campus and see if we can look at a national United States sample. And we did the easiest thing we could do is we did this on MTurk. Of course, we want to pick up Republicans because we didn't have them. Uh, and we did this on MTurk and we were just going to do look at the minimal group. We're not going to do this political group. We're just going to see if people have the same social preferences towards in-group versus out-group in the minimal group setting. And we're going to call those people groupie versus not groupie to make it really simple. And what are our correlates? We added some things though. We added individual personality measures. So for those of you out there who know there's these big five uh, psychology personality measures. We had questionnaires on those. We have lots of individual dem demographics. We have political party affiliation. And because this is on MTurk, we have their locations. So we have their IP addresses. Okay, so what do we find? So uh, I should say the methods are very similar. We had them do the, the t divide them into groups. We looked at their, uh, we estimated the social preferences. We call them groupy but not groupy according to their social preferences, whether they were the same for somebody in their group versus out. So selfish in group, selfish out group versus selfish in group, slam the other person out group. So that latter person is a groupy person. All right, so we divide the subjects into groupy and not groupy. Um, and what do we find? Personality measures, nothing which is indicating that those five personality measures are not sort of picking up what this groupiness is. And of course, if you read what those are, they don't really have much to do with groupiness, but we tested them anyway. Extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, et cetera. Nothing. Individual demographics, uh, really nothing. Again, 
female, age, ethnicity, geographic region, not coming up. Okay, what about religious services, education, um, so on? Nope. But what do we find? Political affiliation. It's there again. Okay. So groupy people are screwed Republican, not groupy are skewed independent. So that not groupy skewing independent is what was going on in our Duke data. Okay. Um, now we wanted to look at region. Um, the reason we were looking, we wanted to look at region is because uh, we didn't actually, I should say that when we first did the MTurk study, we basically didn't get any Republicans in the South. So we oversampled the South so that we could at least have a national Republican sample, and then we looked at the South separately, as you'll see. So we look here, we look at party affiliation and region, and the conclusion that you want to get from this slide is that, again, even if we break it down by region, not groupy skews independent, but groupy skews in particular Southern Republicans. Okay. So if you're a Southern Republican in our data, you're most likely to be a groupy person. Now, again, there's perhaps reasons for this. This is a very contested space. Okay. All right. Now, what about the IP addresses? So I should confess, though we have this in the paper, it's not a big confession, that we, um, after the 2016 election, we decided to look at location, and we looked at two pieces of location. One is we looked for votes for Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, and it's all on the county level. So we know exactly where people live, so we know what county they live in. Okay, so we looked at Hillary Clinton voters versus Donald Trump voters, and there is nothing in terms of groupie versus not groupie versus Clinton voters versus Trump voters. The second thing we did, though, is we looked at deindustrialization, which, of course, we know sort of came out in the news a lot um, after the elections, and generally economic decline in rural areas and economic decline of traditional occupations has been a lot in the news. So we looked at deindustrialization. And so we looked at, as we characterized, this was a huge data project for one little, one, you know, for one table, but I think it's worth it. We went back to the census, we looked at the percentage of jobs for manufacturing by county. Right? And we looked at counties that were more or less deindustrialized. And what I want you to get from this is the counties that were most deindustrialized right, had were more likely to have groupy respondents. Okay? You're with me on that? So deindustrialization, the decline is corresponds to groupy. A little bit more groupy. So it's not a lot, but but more so. It's significant. All right, what do I make of this? I don't know why these people are groupy. It could be because they're attached to place. They didn't leave. This, these, these counties deindustrialized and they're still there, right? It could be that they're attached to place. It, that's possible. So it's a self selection. They stayed there. It could be that the economic conditions are bad. I don't know, but I do know that deindustrialization, um, excuse me, is, has. It, you're more likely to have a groupy person in a deindustrialized county. Okay, I'm going to conclude with what have we learned and where do I think we can go? What have we learned? There is heterogeneity in group settings. There's groupy people and not groupy people. It's a rather robust finding. Um, I didn't get a chance to show you this, but there is a well-defined subset of people who adopt this particularly destructive behavior that I wanted to make sure I gave them the chance to do, and they did it in the experiment. Um, but this groupiness, whatever this is, is not captured by standard personality measures. So it's something new, to the extent that I can tell from reading the social psychology literature. Though some people will say it's sort of related to this and sort of related to that, I'm not able to show that um, directly. Not groupiness is correlated with real world behavior. So in the lab, people who are not groupy are more likely to be politically independent. So the same political positions, but they, um, but they don't join political parties. I should say, and I didn't have a chance to show you, we also see a difference in how groupy people and not groupy people, the speed at which they answer these questions, do the task, and I can return to that if you want. Uh, groupiness is also correlated with real world regional differences. So I mentioned the Republicans. Oh, I should say it's not just the South, it's the deep South. So uh, that's a particular part of the South in the United States, and the decline in jobs for manufacturing. What next? Okay, this is one task. This is income allocation. 
Groupiness could have implications for other kinds of tasks. There's lots of other uh, problems that arise when we have group conflict. One big problem, for example, is we know from a lot of empirical work in economics that areas that have a large amount of ethnic diversity, there's lower contributions to public goods. So people don't pay to send somebody else's kid to school, don't pay to support the school for somebody else's kid, they're less likely to pay as much, more, yeah, I think I said that right, when the person is from a different ethnicity. So uh, what about other settings? So access. what about other settings or other tasks, for example, public goods? Is this groupiness stable, right? So I have these people here in one month. What if I looked at them you know, a year from now? Is it something that is about the individual that's stable over time? Or is it something that that day they didn't feel very well? But again, it is correlated with political independence. So I don't think it's not, I don't think it's unstable, but how stable is it? So we want some sort of individual measure of individual group, independent measure of individual groupiness that's not related to a task and then see how that person, once we have that measure on the person, behaves in different tasks. Is it stable across tasks? Uh, the correlates of groupiness in different studies and tasks. So is public goods different than income allocation? A long list here. Is it where the person comes from, the economic conditions in which they are living now or in which they grew up, ethnic or political conflict. Is it their family, their family income, how they were brought up? Is it the values or culture which they learned in that particular environment? Now, what I've just listed, I should stop here. So those are a lot of the experimental variations. But I think once we realize we have this distinction between people, then there's theoretical questions which emerge. Could it be that people self-select by groupiness? And that kind of, you, know, you think about it, well, it might make sense. The, the, the kid, the 18-year-old who's joining the army in a volunteer army environment is going to be different than the 18-year-old who's deciding not to join the army. Now, they might be into discipline. They might like the physical nature of the, of the, of the task. But they also might be groupy, OK? And that's the army, but what about firms, right? So I set up a particular wage policy where I have tournaments versus piece rate. That's a standard thing we might look at in economics. Well, maybe the people are attracted to being a tournament and a tournament versus piece rate based on this characteristic. So I might be selecting particular people by the types of wage schemes that, that I set up. And of course, once we think that there could be self-selection, then we have to be concerned about the policies we set up to begin with, understanding that we could be in this self-select, in, in a world where people are self-selecting. So the last bullet point is sort of inspiration for theorists out there to try and think about how when we set up certain institutions, we are we perhaps selecting on a trait such as groupiness. Thanks very much. <laughs>